Hello and welcome to another Victoria 3 Developer Diary. Today is going to be sort of like a two-parter from uh, last week's uh, Dev Diary on colonization because we're going to be talking about decentralized nations. So they're, they're kind of, they go the same. They're, they're the same thing. They go together because decentralized nations are the nations that you colonize with colonization. So, you know, it's the same thing. Uh, so I do think it is a good thing that we are going to go back and look at some of the things said in the Colonial Dev Diary comments. So here we have it. Uh, because it seems like things changed between the Dev Diary and the comments being made. And uh, I'll point that out when we get to it. Um, it seems like there's a little bit of confusion going on and I'm not 100% uh, on board or, or understanding it myself. It's um, I think maybe some clarification is, is probably a good thing So will the Congo have extra events attached like the Congo conference or will it follow normal colonization? There will be content for the exploration and colonization of the Congo But that doesn't replace the normal colonization mechanics at no point is anyone awarded free colonial states, which is interesting um, a big part of the Victoria 2 experience if you are not a great power is the potential to be awarded this huge swathe of territory uh, in the Congo uh, that Belgium historically were awarded um, or rather not Belgium but King Leopold himself personally it's historical weirdness let's be honest um, and you could do that if you were a uh, a minor power, I think you also needed to have less than 10 infamy, something like that. Um, and it was, a, it was a pretty big event if you were not a great power. Um, interestingly, there's no point is anyone awarded free colonial states. I mean, can, isn't that kind of what Belgium was awarded? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Are there journal entries that encourage you to colonize? We have a journal called uh, Scramble for Africa, so that would be a yes. I assume colonization of the two Americas will be far easier than Africa. Large portions of Africa are difficult to colonize due to malaria, etc. So for, for the most part, decentralized nations in the Americas are much easier to colonize. Fair enough. Uh, so this is where split states come into play then. I mean, they also come into play with treaty ports, but sure. Anyway, are there laws you can pass to reduce tension growth or increase decay? There are advocates for an ethical colonialism at the time, such as the liberal imperialists of Britain. Will their policy preferences be represented? Colonial repres uh, resettlement improves your tension decay compared to colonial exploitation. We'll also have some content for the East India Company and Dutch, Dutch East Indies inspired by historical attempts to do with heavy quotation marks, ethical colonialism. Uh, but that's not related to the mechanic of colonizing decentralized nations. Gotcha. Uh, is it correctly understood that growing a colony is practically expanding it to more provinces within said state? And what is the economic costs to expanding a colony? Could I make one with, say, Lübeck? Uh, and can you give an estimate as to how expensive colonizing and maintaining colonies is? Uh, do you need a large and medium-sized economy to do that, or is it feasible for miners as well? So, that's correct. Colony growth is based on province-by-province -province expansion into a state region. The economic cost is represented by the cost of maintaining the government administrations that generate the bureaucracy used to invest in the colonial affairs institution. This is scale to your population, which is good for small countries because they can invest about as easily as a large country, but also bad because the impact is also scaled to your incorporated population, meaning small countries ultimately still colonize at a slower rate. Makes sense. Um... I know historically some small countries uh, didn't have such good luck with colonizing. I'm thinking of like Scotland, but this is long before this time period. Um, the Dutch is a small nation, uh, but uh, they quite successfully colonized um, in the East. Um, yeah, but you know, the larger powers, Britain, France, Spain, uh, had a much easier time at colonizing. This is absolutely true. Even if it was more expensive for them, maybe. Do military expeditions play any role in colonial expansion? They absolutely should. The military role of colonial expansion is represented partially by the need to respond with force to native uprisings in decentralized nations and partially by invasions of the centralized countries in Africa. More on which countries are which next, you know, more on which countries are decentralized countries uh, are, are next week. Okay, fair enough. And that's what we're going to be talking about in just a moment. Uh, what limits are there on how many colonies you can start at once? 
Is it cost restricting or is it some kind of hard cap number? You can start as many colonies as you like, but your total growth will be split between each colony. So starting a large number of colonies will make each one grow painfully slowly, which increases the time until you'll be able to add the state to your national market, increases the chances of generating tension, and leaves more time for your rival to start up competing colonies. Cool. Makes sense. And then finally we have this part. Uh, I'm going to jump in with some clarifications about colonial states here, and my bad for missing this when reviewing the dev diary internally. The old design worked exactly as Neon DT outlined in the dev diary. Um, that is, a colonial state is different from an unincorporated state, which is different from an incorporated state. But we recently made some changes. Specifically, we unified the concepts of colonial and unincorporated states, as the line between colony and territory is a little more, uh, more than a little blurry. We made it possible to incorporate any state, though with a varying amount of time and resource investment, based on cultural ties. While a state is being incorporated, you pay all the costs for it and receive only partial benefits. Sorry for the confusion. There is no longer a distinction between a colonial state and an unincorporated state. So no, this isn't a thing. Whether an unincorporated state is more of a colony or more of a loosely administrated territory depends on the country's policies. Uh, it's an interesting distinction and, and an interesting change, and it's more than a little awkward that this was relegated to being in a comment rather than in the dev diary itself. Um, but yeah, I mean, he, he points out here his bad for missing it when reviewing the dev diary. Uh, it's, it's like I say, it's just a little bit awkward, but you know, the, the clarification has been made now, so I guess, um, I guess that's that. So, uh, with that said, with that done, with that out of the way, we should probably look at today's dev diary, which is, as I have previously mentioned, on decentralized nations. Hello, folks. I'm Offaloaf. Well, I'm, I'm Lambert, but I'm reading Offaloaf's comments. Uh, one of the content designers on Victoria 3. I'm here today to talk about decentralized nations. What are they and why are they there? To start with, let's talk about what came before and take a quick look at what Victoria well, Victoria Revolutions, and Victoria 2 did when it came to regions outside of traditional imperial homelands. So we have Africa in Victoria Revolutions, uh, a lot of provinces, very strange looking borders like that that area uh, in like Algeria is just very, very awkward. But you can definitely see, uh, you know, certain themes come up, you know, Ethiopia's there, we've got Sokoto there, uh, the Cape is there, Madagascar's its own thing, and just a whole lot of nothingness in between makes makes sense above africa as it was represented in victoria uh, revolutions so this um most of the continent is open territory for any great power to colonize there's people living there but they don't do anything outside of a few limited places like sokoto they're represented by nothing they do not own anything on their own when added to a colonizing power they just immediately become pawns of the imperial game and don't really care for independence or their own homeland now we have Africa in Victoria 2, Hearts of Darkness. Mostly the same thing, honestly. Um, not much has really changed uh, between the two. The provinces are, you know, better sizes um, and more, more accurate. The map's nicer. But generally speaking, not much has changed when it comes to the, the layout of various uh, things. So... Uh, the same is broadly true in Victoria 2. Regions historically colonized by imperial powers, such as most of Africa and parts of the Americas, are represented as unclaimed swathes of land just waiting for an empire to come by and colonize them. The people who do live there uh, do not care who marches in, will just be members of one empire or another forevermore after they're colonized. It's a model that could use some improvement. It didn't do justice to the people who historically lived there, and frankly, it made colonial gameplay kind of boring. That's entirely fair. It is entirely fair. I don't know if I would go uh, so far as to say it was boring. Um, the 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 colonies or the the people that lived there obviously didn't do anything in Victoria too, and it was boring to just colonize. The interest in colonization was not based on the where or what was happening there. It was always based on your conflicts that arose with other colonizing powers. Um, the, it was always an external, away from Africa thing that made colony in Africa interesting, which maybe should not be the case. But let's have a look at what Africa looks like in Victoria 3 
and immediately you can tell it's way busier, way, way, way busier. Um, we've got lots more incorporated states. Of course, we've got Sokoto as usual, uh, but then we've got uh, Demargram, I think, Bornu, uh, Wadai, we've got the Ashanti, Dahomey, uh, Benin is there. Uh, lots and lots of incorporated you know, nations uh, in, in the, you know, I think it's the coast of Guinea, um, and just a whole lot more unincorporated. Like the, it's not just empty, right? This place isn't empty. It's got the air people there, or this place isn't empty. It's got the Adag people there, um, and I think that's that's cool. It looks much busier, much more lively, uh, full of life because you know there were people living there for sure. Um, so yeah, I, I quite like the look of it, but let's have a read about it. In Victoria 3, decentralized nations exist to address both the issues of gameplay and better represent representation of indigenous peoples. No matter where an empire tries to colonize, somebody already lives there. I take issue with this statement because the British colonized the Falkland Islands and nobody lived there when we did that. It just didn't happen. It, no matter where an empire tries to colonize, unless it's the Falklands, somebody already lives there. Unless it's the Falklands. Unless you're talking about the penguins. If you're talking about the penguins, I forgive you, and that's entirely fair. They're organized, although they don't have the same level of internal, uh, international recognition and administrative organization as, say, the Congress of Vienna attendees. No formal declaration of war needs to be made in order to make an incursion into the territories of decentralized nations and start colonizing. Although the deeper you colonize into a decentralized nation's lands, the more likely it is diplomatic play will kick off where the decentralized nation starts a real war of resistance against you. Even if a colony is successfully established, the people living there aren't just pawns. They remember that they weren't always colonized subjects, and just like any part of an empire, they'll agitate for independence if conditions are right. Mapping these nations has been a challenge. We essentially started with the Victoria 2 map as a base to build off of, which meant we had a lot of work to do just gathering information for peoples across the globe. Records of who lived where and how many people lived there have been difficult to obtain for some regions. Gameplay considerations have also driven some design choices, but let's look at North America for an example of that process. So we have uh, North America here. A snippet of the beautiful draft image used when presenting uh, the original proposal. Um, yeah, no, that's very busy, <laughs> let's be honest, it's very, very busy. Uh, this is part of a one drafted proposal for the implementation of decentralized nations in North America. There's already some compromises in this version. Peoples have been consolidated into some larger polities, and some state borders have been followed largely because having just one or two provinces on the other side of a state line can create regions too small to do uh, to provide anything or anybody. 400 pops living in state X aren't able to provide enough men to contribute a single battalion to a native uprising, among other things. This design isn't just for the decentralized nations. It's something we also do elsewhere in the world when trying to balance historical accuracy with gameplay, although we of course try to avoid steering too far from actual history. So this is the proposal that we have, and what we end up with in the game is this. Um, so we can see... I don't... Hmm. It's very different. It is very different. The Osseti Sakowin has turned into the Great Sioux Nation. Uh, the Pawnee is there, but Cheyenne has rem been removed. Uh, Ute has been changed. Uh, there's, there's a lot of changes. There's a lot of differences between the two. Even with these considerations, we still end up pursuing a modified version of that proposal uh, that did more to preserve the borders of larger imperial borders. We didn't want too many avenues for the United States to colonize its way into historic Canadian territories or for Mexico to colonize its way into Minnesota. He does miss the Council of Three Fires and hope he can get back in, but it depends on getting a design hammered out that works with the considerations and limitations we just went over above. Other regions uh, had design considerations made in their implementation too. So we've got uh, New Guinea here, um, and 
I don't know. There is no image for what it is in game, but that's a whole lot of. I, I do. I do remember that this region is famous for having so many languages in such a small area. So yeah, I imagine um, trying to figure this out is just insane. And, and good luck to the people who are uh, who are working on that. Gonna be real with you, there's no way we're going to accurately and sufficiently map out all the peoples in New Guinea. That's one region where I think we've probably done the most consolidation, but I think it was necessary in order to provide anything like the combined strength needed in order to give the indigenous peoples of New Guinea a decent punch in case of a native uprising. Yeah, no, fair enough. Uh, and then we have West Africa here again. Uh, it is indeed Demagaram. I've never heard of Demagaram, but fair enough. Um... West Africa is way more busy. It looks a lot more like uh, HPM, the historical province, uh, historical project mod, I think it's called uh, for Vic Two, than it does, you know, base vanilla game Vic Two, which is a good thing, definitely a good thing. West Africa had many design decisions made since it was first mapped out for Victoria Three. As mentioned above, the original map built off was Victoria Two's, so the first thing done was just getting some entity everywhere on the map. This early draft has been revised and revised and revised again, and will probably still be subject to further revisions. Countries that were first marked as decentralized have been centralized, such as the Ashanti Empire, and tag additions and renamings are a thing that's happened already and will happen again as we continue to invest time into research and listen to the feedback from the fans. Decentralized nations give life to regions that have been treated as blank states up until now. Mapping them out and getting them right and balancing the challenges of precision and gameplay are a constant struggle, one which are constantly tackling and working through. The result of this, though, is a world that feels much more alive, and one that we hope you'll be happily exploring at Victoria 3's release. So, he's terrible at transitions, fair enough. Next week, uh, Neon DT is back, and he's going to ship some monumental information there, uh, talking about canals and monuments. Interesting. Okay. Uh, what do I think of this? I am just going to find an image of the map of Africa. There we go. So you can look at that beautiful map. Um, what do I think of this? Um, it is a much better map. It is just a much better map for Africa. Uh, I think that is pretty objective I would say um, it is a lot closer to what we see in the HPM HFM uh, just the various Victoria 2 mods that you know focus on historical accuracy they've all got a much similar map to what we see in Victoria 3 than what we see in vanilla Victoria 2 which is you know th they were onto something clearly um, is it going to result in a better experience uh, when you know when colonizing? Yeah, probably. Um, so yeah, I, I can't see any issue with it. I am a little concerned that it will be too easy to rush some colonization. Say you're playing as two Sicilies in Italy. Um, is it going to be possible for you to go and conquer Benin and Sokoto and Bornu and Damagaram and Ashanti and Dahomey and all of these places uh, long before they were historically colonized? Um, hopefully not. We'll see. We'll see what happens there. Uh, because I do... Rec In Victoria 2, like, the strategy was to rush Sokoto. Um... Hopefully that's not going to be the case again. Um, hopefully that that element is avoided, uh, but we'll have to wait and see. I'm excited for colonization. Uh, I think it's probably going to be a fun system in Victoria Three, so and and an improvement over what has come before it. Um, I'm like, see you you if you've been with me on this journey through the Victoria Three Dev Diaries, you know that I haven't been positive about absolutely every single one of them you know i've i've got my opinions on you know what will be better than what came before it and what is going to be worse than what came before it i think this definitely comes into the category of better than victoria 2's version uh and i hope guys agree because you know having improvements over time is it's kind of what we all want right but anyway let me know if you do agree with me uh, in the comment section below um what would your ideal colonization system be um, for Victoria 3, uh, not real life, because it's 
you know, there's only really one answer for that one. Uh, but yeah, thank you all very much for watching. I hope to see you in the comment section below. And also, I will see you next week for another developer diary. Bye-bye.